Hello and welcome to Reinfused. This is a special video uh, in conjunction with UKIE's 30 Years of Play campaign. Uh, it celebrates the last 30 years of the British gaming industry, uh, effectively. We're going to be taking a brief look at the start of the UK games industry and how it laid the groundwork for the start of where we are now. So, I'm an old fart. <laughs> So it's an especially important era for me because it's it's really this also marks the start of when I got my education in software engineering. So it's yeah, it's it means quite a lot uh, as do these machines behind me, most of the spectrums I'll admit I uh, came late to the rest of them. Yeah, the spectrum's the best one so that's not a problem. <laughs> right today the industry is is huge. It uh, outgrosses pretty much every other entertainment sector around especially films uh, it's fan base numbers in the millions and it's pretty much just a, a kind of an integral part of society as we know it there's, there's very few people who don't know of the games industry and even fewer who don't take part in it somehow whether it's by playing Fortnite or playing mobile games but it wasn't always like that um, just a few years back well a few decades back now of course <laughs> and uh the industry then was more a world of bedroom coders and a very niche group of society, um, mostly fringe groups. The story of how it exploded into a an international phenomena is it's interesting on its own, but it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're looking at here. My I mean, generally, people will talk about Nintendo and the NES. Um, my take on it, as I've said about it before, is really that it was Sony that, that turned things around. The original PlayStation was the catalyst to making the industry what it is now, uh, just because it, it kind of brought a cool factor to it. But that's okay. <laughs> that's out of the scope of this. So uh, we're going to really be looking at the 1980s, the early 1980s especially, which is kind of when... Really, we started to look at games as a real business on its own. So, okay, back at this point, home computing is still pretty niche. The UK, uh, especially, it was it was pretty rare for an average family to have any kind of computer, and it's mostly down to cost. And so, at this point, we kind of enter uh, Sir Clive Sinclair, although just as he was back then, just Clive Sinclair he didn't get his knighthood until afterwards, and. He really believed that computing uh, and, in fact, an, an engineering should be available for everyone. He was quite passionate about that. So his biggest drive was making computers affordable. In fact, uh, his biggest drive was making all sorts of electronic devices affordable, but computers are the one that's pertinent to what we're talking about. Now, he released a, a lot of revolutionary products. Um, the MK14 was kind of like a first real hobbyist computer that he released, but really it all kind of begins with the ZX80 and the ZX81. Now, these were still kit machines, effectively. You could buy them in a kit. You could eventually buy them as one unit, but they were really being driven as a home hobbyist system, so you built it yourself. Although it wasn't, you know, there wasn't, wasn't that much work into building it. A lot of it was done for you. And it was these really simple but also very cheap computers that sparked the revolution, and it got people more interested in having... A computer at home. It gave them more of an understanding of how useful these machines could be. So Clive had a vision for for what computing in the home would be. He really saw it as being uh, an educational and a business thing. He, games weren't really in his mindset at all. It was, I mean, if anything, they were kind of an awkward intruder onto uh, onto what he was trying to build, and that that really was a factor for his whole time in the computing industry. But it really didn't become long before these these initial pioneers into this new computing world realised that games would be a fairly successful market uh, for uh, to the people that were buying them. And they started to sell, make and sell fairly like simple games. These were simple machines, so they had simple games. And because there was no real... Um, there was no retailer that was selling all of this stuff, really... It was mostly done for, via mail order. Most of Sinclair sales for his machines were mail order as well. So there wasn't really an infrastructure for selling computers at this point. So 
all of these hobbyist gamers, they would be making their games, they would be labeling themselves, they would then be putting adverts into, into magazines and selling the games that way, posting them, putting them through the poster, which was, uh, it was interesting. Effectively, I mean, we're looking at the, the very kind of, um, the initial starting of the single cell publisher, really. It was, it was the, the first growth of a publisher system. And, uh, it's interesting that we kind of go in a 360, but that's, I digress. That's for later to, to fill that one in. If we look at some of these early games, I mean, one of them, which is kind of a standout at this time because it, it lasted for a long time is, uh, is Football Manager by Kevin Tobbs. Now, Football Manager, if you don't know, you probably see Football Manager now. I know it has the same name. It's not actually really connected to these original games, but it is exactly as you think. It's a, it's a football uh, management game, or I guess if you're in America, a soccer management game. It was very simple. Uh, Kevin Toms had ported it from the Video Genie, which was a TRS-8 compatible machine. And um, it kind of it was showed really that there was this growing market for games. And all they were really starved of was a platform to build them for. The, the ZX-8 and the ZX-1 were the beginnings of that platform. They weren't powerful machines by any means. And in fact, they were fairly underpowered even for the time. But they were cheap. And they were based on the, the Zilog Z80, which was a very robust, uh, very uh, uh, usable CPU, which was, which was purposed in a lot of other machines as well. So it was quite well known. So Sinclair looks at this market. Uh, again, he's still not really interested in games, but he sees that a lot more people are coming on board, but power really is his is his big issue. And so they go back to the drawing board and his engineers start redeveloping and they come up with the Sinclair Spectrum. This is kind of where everything begins. This is really where everything begins. The Sinclair Spectrum, when you look at it, is not a huge advance over the ZX80 and the ZX81. It has more memory. It started with 16K, but eventually you, it was really a 48K model that was the, the main breadline for this system. It had a, uh, a ULA, which had a lot of functions built into one silicon, which gave it um, a lot of extra abilities, including, and most importantly, was this uh, a much better way of using the screen. The ZX80 and the ZX81 had an issue where the screen needed to blank every time a key was pressed because it relied on the same interrupts. The Spectrum didn't have that. It had some clever circuitry to get around that. And uh, that instantly gave it way more power. And it added color. Not great color. The Spectrum had a very, a very interesting way that it handled the screen. And unfortunately, whilst it was very clever and very uh, memory efficient, it didn't allow for particularly great looking games. Uh, color clash is something that you'll see a lot of and hear a lot of <laughs> Spectrum games. And it was caused by this interesting way of handling the screen. But these things were built to a price and uh, Sinclair was attempting to get them released for the lowest price possible. And, you know, he really did as well. He he does genuinely seem to have been trying to lower the price so he could sell it lower rather than just make more profit. Part of his problem was making profit as uh, the reason why he's not around in the computer industry now. Although he is still making stuff and uh, he is one of my personal heroes. So anything I say that sounds bad, trust me, I, he, I credit him with me being in the position I am now as a software engineer his work with the Spectrum and, get, and allowing my rather poor family to get me a machine to practice on, I think that's, that's pretty much got me up to speed. Uh, by the time I hit college, I'd already um, knew it all <laughs> and acted like I did as well. Uh, so, yeah, he's a hero of mine. So anything I say that sounds derogatory, it really isn't. It's, it's, it's just based on fact, unfortunately. <laughs> so, the Spectrum released... It was slightly more powerful than the Z81. It was still based on the Zilog Z80 CPU. So the learning curve to go from these machines, uh, the Z80 and Z81 and other machines at the time as well, to the Spectrum was pretty shallow. Which meant that all of these developers that had been honing their skills making these games for made order were pretty much able to just jump straight across to this new machine. And this was massively important because this industry, whilst it was still small, it had been growing. And... If you've got an industry that's growing, you don't want to just kind of throw away everyone that's involved in it. Uh, 
So we see the beginning of the industry. The market uh, has increased with a variety of machines. Acorn has released their BBC Micro, which they did in conjunction with the British Broadcasting Corporation. But they've also started now to try and get their cut price electron out where they're trying to compete with the Spectrum. The BBC Micro was a very uh, flexible machine. It had a lot built into it. A very powerful machine as well. Probably by far one of the most powerful at the time if you look at everything it could do. But with that power came a lot of money and a lot of uh, cost. And when you compared it to the Spectrum, it didn't really do enough more than the Spectrum to justify all the extra costs. And so the Electron was a way to try and get some of that power into the hands of consumers that might have bought Spectrum. It was it was relatively successful in hardware terms. It was not successful in, in sales terms, but... Uh, the market was was fast becoming um, much more narrow, even with all these machines coming in. Uh, we also got Amstrad, which released the <laughs> no, that side, <laughs> which was the, released the CBC four six four, another Zilog Z eighty based machine. Now, like Sinclair, uh, Alan Sugar very much was building stuff to a price point. The difference between Sugar and Sinclair is that Alan Sugar was doing it for business reasons and he very quickly realised that games were the key to that, the key to making money in the industry. And so the C the CPC was built around making good games and they really succeeded very well. In England, you don't see it as much for the basic reason that the Spectrum was vastly more successful and so a lot of the CPC games are just bad ports from from the spectrum. If you go to France, where the CBC was by far the most, um, I keep pointing out the wrong shoulder, <laughs> was, by, was by far the most successful machine, then you'll see that the games that were written for the CPC first and then ported to other machines, they are really high quality and um, it is genuinely a good machine. I mean, you saw, you see it in uh, the GX4000, uh, which is Amstrad's attempt at a console. Now they released that far too late. It ended up really competing with the 16 bit machines where it had no chance. But if you actually play some of the games on it, uh, if it had come out just a year before where it had more of a competition with the NES and the Mars system, it had a real chance it was definitely more powerful than them. And it's, it was really just based on a slightly enhanced <laughs> version. Of, just remember, it's on the opposite side to what you're looking at. And then I'm fine. Anyway, it's really it's based on just an enhanced version of that CPC. And so um, what we have here are a couple of really powerful... British made machines and then to really make up the, the, the triumvirate of machines which which really took over the market we had uh, an American invasion and that American invasion I'm sure everyone realizes who's into retro was the Commodore 64 which was a genuine powerhouse it was a very powerful machine again Commodore had realized that games would be important and so they had given it uh, good graphic ability and also really, really good sound ability. Probably the best sound of the 8-bit era. The SID chip is uh, it's an amazing chip. It's got a very unique sound. And and that's really it. At this point, the market with all these other machines, there's like, like the Dragon 32, uh, all sorts of, uh, lots of machines. <laughs> they were really on the periphery and companies were starting to go bust, but it was really just, it was the Spectrum, the Commodore and the Amstrad in that order. The Amstrad was a fairly distant third in the UK, uh, literally just because it kind of had an issue with uh, marketing. Uh, the Spectrum had been out for far longer, had a lot more games being made for it, and because of that, uh, it, it didn't really have a chance to compete with the Spectrum. The Commodore 64 also had been out in America for a while, had a lot of heritage with them. A lot of games were ported across to make to work with, with the PAL video system. So it instantly kind of had a bigger library as well than the Amstrad. Uh, and so really it's that. It's, it's if Amstrad had been, again, just a little bit earlier with the CPC, it's, it may have stood a better chance. And whilst I am very much a, a Spectrum fanboy, <laughs> I will freely admit that the Amstrad was a much better machine. At this point, though, we are really still seeing all of this development being done in bedrooms by single programmer. So a programmer would make everything. They would make the graphics, they would make the sound, they would make the actual code of the game. They would then, at this point, put it on a tape, sell it by mail order. This was now starting to change. And what we saw a lot of were these 
embryonic publishers were starting to appear. So companies that might have made their own games but wanted to sell other ones. Occasionally it was shops that <laughs> were opening up to sell like games, but now they decided they were going to publish their own and you know, things like that. And what they were doing mostly was they were going after these small bedroom developers and trying to get their games off them before they released them themselves. They had contacts with retailers. We start to see shops starting to sell games and computers now. Uh, in, in the UK, especially, it was W. H. Smiths and Boots. They were really the main ones. That's where, especially in my time, after school, you would find us all in W. H. Smiths or Boots. Mostly W. H. Smith. Boots were a bit staid and a bit a bit serious. W. H. Smiths, they kind of got the idea of what gaming was about. And well, I, I don't know, maybe I, I'm basing this solely on Basingstoke. But when you used to go into W. H. Smiths in Basingstoke, if you wanted to try a game out, somebody would just come out and they'd, they'd load it up for you and you'd just be able to try it out and they wouldn't chase you away. They'd, they'd kind of let you play because they knew maybe you didn't buy a game then, but you'd be back and you would buy lots of games. And it was that knowledge which kind of gave them a more relaxed idea to gaming. And I think that's why they did so so well back in those days. It's kind of a, it's a shame they really... They dropped out of the game's industry at that just after the 8-bit era finished i understand why it became much more of a specialized retailer in uh, sector and it really was his own thing it, it, and you can't really compete with that if you're doing lots of other stuff as well the supermarkets now are trying to compete and you can see they they do sometimes get the odd exclusive and they get a slightly cheaper price but it's still hard to compete with the likes of game and electronic boutique and what have you so, made order was starting to disappear. Shots were starting to sell. Uh, the games and all these producers were now starting to pop up, which were putting adverts in cassettes, adverts in papers to try and get programmers to send them their titles. It's a, we kind of reached now a new halfway house between what was happening at that point with the bedroom developers and what we have now with the big monolithic publishers. So, all of these small publishers were basically just trying to get all the games and, and sell them themselves. The idea, obviously, that they get a larger cut of the money and they didn't have to worry about developing the software themselves either, which is uh, the, the best of both worlds, really. You're, you're getting a cut of that money, but you're not having to hire programmers as such. You're just giving them a cut. This, um, this has a few issues. You're really reliant on these bedroom developers who are mostly doing it part-time or after school or whilst in the middle of you know not being in work they're just kind of uh signing on the job center and writing software which does not lead to a very stable way of getting games made but this was a flourishing market games were being sold uh, at a higher and higher rate our, our free winners if you will so the spectrum the commodore and the amstrad they were getting vast amounts of software added to the library just constantly. And yeah, a lot of it was rubbish, but there were some, some genuinely standout titles. I'll, I've been overlaying games on the screen at some point to highlight these facts. I'm sure I'll remember in editing and I, I won't forget, and this will just be me looking blank at a screen. Now, because these machines had uh, this, this vast amount of software in a, in a relatively short amount of time, the mail order side of this just started to die off. By nat naturally, it started to die off. There was far more money in these games being mass produced, stuck into a shop and sold there than it was just making as many as you could to send over post and, and hoping the right people saw your ad in a, in a newspaper somewhere. Uh, the publishers were, as you said, they were trying to get the software, but they're hiring contractors to write certain bits of software. So you saw this a lot, especially with film licenses or arcade licenses, where they would hire a programmer just to kind of do one task and then pay them for that. And that was it. Then they had their game to release. Again, moving slightly more towards the owning everything themselves, but still not having to hire full-time developers but this was this was changing uh, especially with publishers like us gold which was really for the uk one of the first of the big publishers they were started to port software from america into the uk hence the name us gold 
but they really they started to publish their own stuff as well. They started to buy a lot of the IP from these developers and effectively buying the developers themselves to work in inside teams. We saw it with Ocean as well, where they became more of a very complete software house where all of the software was made inside or with satellite groups that were given the task to do the code and the time frame to do it in. And we're moving now more into this publisher pattern, which we, we have effectively now. Especially if we look at like a, one of the truly great British developers was a company called Ultimate Play the Game. Now they started out as a software developer, working in arcades actually, but then they kind of ended up becoming their own publisher. So they started to do all of the marketing themselves, they started to get the production themselves, to sell it to the stores, and so they became a fully, effectively a fully fledged publisher when that didn't really exist at that point. So they were making all the software themselves. They were get. They were selling it themselves. They were reducing it themselves. Now, because of this, and because of the high quality of their software, they were considered the best software developers on the eight-bit world at that point. They really were the first of these publisher developer rock star houses to appear, where they really their level of fandom was pretty much as high as a band at the time, where well <laughs> for the market where the uh, Video game players really treated them as icons, icons for the industry. Eventually, as the 8-bit market started to kind of tail off, the 16-bit machines were coming in, but they weren't growing in in popularity as much as the 8-bit machines did, and the Japanese were starting to import their consoles into the UK and Europe. So people like Ultimate were starting to see the writing on the wall. So what Ultimate did was they just sold their name and their back catalogue to US Gold and they called themselves Rare and then they got a license from Nintendo to make games for the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. And that's what we know them as now, owned by Microsoft and sorely misused, but Rare are still effectively the same company. They've lost their, the leads that started it. But the the effectively the company is, is the same. I'm sure there are a few people still left over from the old days. I doubt that many anymore though. We're coming to the end of the 8-bit era. We're starting to really see the bones of these monolithic publishers appear. The uh, It's the, basically the pattern for what we have now. Games were no longer being made by one developer. Uh, a generally, a, a publisher would either get an idea or get a license. They would have an artist. They would have a musician. They would have multiple programmers working on this as well. Certainly, they'd have a separate programmer for every format unless they licensed the format out, which they did a lot for some of the periphery systems like MSX. But again, we're starting to see this move away from having a developer just make a game and then pass it on. We're starting to see the control coming in where the publishers now are starting to really want to to have a say in every aspect of this game development. We're also at this point starting to see a rise in the cost of games. And this rise is, of course, due to the amount of money being pushed into each game. With more people working on the game, the cost that it takes to make that game goes up. And the publisher generally pushes that straight on to the consumer. We're seeing that now. Very much that's where we are now, where games cost a relatively large amount of money. But that's kind of a a reflection of the amount of investment that goes into each of those games. Now, don't get me started on some of those aspects. Uh, (laughs) There are, there are issues around how publishers are dealing with prices of games now and extra bits of games, but that's not part of this. But it really, it brings us to the end of the story. If you, um, if you go in now and you do a search of, of UK games publishers, there are still quite a few of them, but in terms of ones back from this 8-bit era, the vast majority of them are defunct. They either closed down or they were bought out by other developers, uh, other publishers, and then closed down as well. There are a few standouts, like Codemasters is largely the same company as it always was. Uh, they've managed to... Their cohesion has been amazing for all, for all these years, and they're still there, and they're still making relevant games. Uh, and pretty much, yeah, that's a, it's had a consistent role in the industry since its inception, really. Um, but 
even though they're not around anymore, a lot of these publishers, the impact they had, the development of how the games industry went from the bedroom to this industry, it's undeniable the how that's that's evolved into what we have now. It's undeniable that those British publishers really had an incredible uh, effect on where we are now. The developers especially, you still see a lot of those developers are still around. Uh, if you look at games like Grand Theft Auto, there's still a lot of those developers, a lot of the people that were involved in the industry from the early beginnings, they're still there. And uh, they may have changed their address to another continent, but they're still the, the British programmers that were making games for these 8 and 16-bit machines back then. Right, that's it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Do look out for... Other things from the, the this 30 Years of Play campaign, there will be other videos, there will be lots of other stuff, there's events. Uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting idea, and I think it's going to produce some really interesting content. Probably stuff better than this, but hey, hopefully not too bad. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you like the video, please hit like. If you really like the video, please hit subscribe. If you didn't like the video or you have something else to say, then please leave it in the comments below. See you next time.